there's a, a question here. What if a, a non-atheist, or an atheist for that matter, asks regarding why homosexuality is forbidden? How should one, how should you respond? I think this kind of like links in a little bit with the question that uh, Mufti Saab just had right now, in the sense that Islam is what we refer to as the deen of the fitra. It's the deen of the, I think a good translation is like the organic nature of mankind. What is organic? Like you buy something organic from the store, it means there's no pesticides, there's no chemicals, it's natural. It's grown in a normal way, not in some kind of mutant freakish way with genetically modified uh, seeds that that are like made in a lab and that don't reproduce as you know with weird chemicals in the 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 soil and all it's normal it's just natural right islam is the deen of the fitra the nabi is nabi ummi right nabi is the unlettered prophet is what ummi means but literally what ummi means is somebody born of a mother right and all of us are ummi it's natural it's normal it's like something that every human being has in common right he's a very human nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam um and so there are a number of things that that Islam does to reinforce the fitra, the the organic nature of a person, rather than take it away, take them away from it. And so, the organic nature of a human being is that a man is attracted to a woman, and a woman is attracted to a man. Um, and the organic nature of a man also, and this is something that this is not just something that we're making up because we're you know whatever movies from the madrasa or whatever. You can go read psych, uh, psychiatric studies. Normally, a man will desire multiple partners, and normally a woman will desire only one because she values stability over over uh, uh, over uh, over having a great number of partners. Whereas a man, if you look at the entire, like I don't want to make this into a biology lesson, people will freak out because we're in the masjid. But you know, a, a man can father like. A, a, you know, really the sky is the limit to the number of children a, a, a man can father at the same time, biologically. Whereas a woman, how many children can she bear in her womb at once? One set, you know, like one, twins, maybe three or four. But she can only bear one pregnancy in her womb at one time, right? So stability is more important for her, biologically, right? This is the fitra, this is the organic nature of a human being. Does this mean that some woman may have an abnormal psychology in which she wishes for more than one partner. It's possible. It happens. May this be, may this mean that a, a human being can have an abnormal psychology in which a man is attracted to a man and a woman is attracted to a woman. It's possible. It's possible. But these are all, they're all illnesses that take a person f- away from the fitra. And it's possible. Imagine, I mean, this is something kind of like people made, especially because younger kids are here, they're a little immature with these things. But imagine if a man is attracted to another man, or a, tra- a man is attracted to other men. This doesn't mean that they're a bad person. What does it mean? If they make amal on it, right? If they actually act out on that feeling, then it's a sin. But if the, just the feeling is there, if they suppress it, they'll receive reward for it. How many men are attracted to women? It's haram for them to be with, Right? Somebody sees like such some girl walking down the street. You're, that's why you're supposed to lower your gaze so as to not put yourself in the and have to fight the uphill battle again. But if a man sees a, a heterosexual man sees a woman and is attracted to her, if he doesn't do something haram with her, he'll receive reward. Right? Just like that. It's maybe somebody their their psychology for whatever reason is abnormal. Right? They will have this attraction to another man as long as they suppress it out of their fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That person will actually be rewarded for it. Maybe they pray five times a day in the masjid. Maybe they cry at, you know, when they listen to the Quran and this is just a test Allah gave them. Uh, uh, so that person will go to Jannah. And one of the sifat, one of the, one of the attributes of Jannah is that when a person enters Jannah, they'll be cleansed of all illnesses that they have. Just like a person who lost their leg, in, you know, or lost their arm, or was disabled, or was blind. You know, when they enter Jannah, they'll get their sight back again. They'll get their leg back again. They'll get their arm back again. They won't enter Jannah in a state of decrepit old age, but they'll enter in youth. They'll enter whole and in their, in their prime, right? Just like that, people who have these, uh, these issues, those issues will be cleansed of them when they enter into Jannah. Why? Because Islam is, Islam, it teaches us the organic, the fitra, the organic nature of a person is what we want to go back to. We don't want, we don't want to be the chemical, uh, you know, destroyed cheap stuff that, that, that the supermarkets are filled with and that are killing people. Uh, so that's how we explain it. If people at this, at the, at the end of that explanation don't like your explanation, don't accept it, that's their problem. You don't need to worry about it. You need to, you don't need to trip. But that's, that's the answer to that question. You get, I get answers. Why can't, don't women have, uh, some sort of like, hurain men have? How come women can't have so many partners? This is considered unnatural. If a man, if a man, uh, 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 you know, uh, expresses a desire to have more than one partner, 
They say, oh, look, he's very manly. Right? We don't express that desire because it's haram, but it's considered manly. What if a man legally, like lawfully, like f- four women fall in love with him and he marries them and they're happy? You say, man, this guy's like an alpha male, man. Look at this guy. Right? What do they say, what do they say about a woman who wants more than one partner? It's not nice. It's considered an insult. Even if it is true, a woman will be insulted if you say that to her. Right? That's a proof that in, in our sharia, that's not, that's not, uh, it's not something, if it's something that when a woman enters into Jannah, she'll have that, that, that desire, you know, purified from her heart. She won't have to deal with that anymore. I don't have a question. Here, this is a mufti question. <laughs> that's your field. It's like all these mufti questions. That's fine. I don't mind. <laughs> What advice can you give somebody, a uh, Muslim who has left Islam? I'm going to leave all the long answers to uh, Sheikh Hamza. Uh, I always give sh- very short answers in Q&A. Um, but for this one, what, what advice would I give to anyone who left Islam? Uh, I would advise you to speak to scholars or knowledgeable people in Islam and speak to them on theology because Islam can logically definitely be proven. And um, I don't really have an academic degree, but Sheikh Hamza Mahbul here, mashallah, biomedical. Biochemistry. biochemistry. He's actually, mashallah, he has a, a degree uh, in biochemistry, and he's uh, and that's what it was his field. And you know, he studied Islam as well. So he's been through the whole college phase. He's been through the whole uh, phase where you know the the, the professor tries to uh, 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 dismantle uh, religion and theology altogether. Uh, so he's very well uh, rounded in this field where he can explain from that angle as well. So this obviously is a very lengthy discussion on you know because a person can have dozens of questions, dozens of angles to the question. But people like Sheikh Hamza and other scholars, you know, who have this background, especially if they're young, it's very easy for younger people to relate with other younger scholars. Uh, is because they won't get judged. You know, when you're, when you're a kid and you go to your parents and you tell them, well, you know what, I doubt Islam, you're probably going to get a smack or two, right? But, um, you know, these, Islam is not, it, it can't be forced upon you. It's a state of the heart. So you really have to believe it in, in your heart. You can't just say, I'm a Muslim and not believe it in your heart. You have to believe it in your heart. And there's nothing wrong in going and asking and bringing your objections. Uh, and uh, based on your personality and who you like, you know, you can go and resort, uh, or go to different, different scholars. Uh, Sheikh Hamza's here. Afterwards, if you want to privately come to me, you can take my card. Contact me later on uh, via Facebook or text, whatever. This is a serious question. You know, a lot of people leave Islam. And this is a reality, especially a lot of youth. Uh, and uh, we are to blame is because we don't have enough manpower around to go and uh, give them answers and give them information and educate them. They come, they go to their parents or their local imam or they're told that, you know what, it's a taboo question, don't ask. And they, they live with this doubt and, and ultimately they leave the deen. And whereas, you know, oh, Brother Omar Bajwa is here as well, who has, uh, mashallah, uh, he's a chaplain at Yale University. You know, you need more people like him that have good religious backgrounds and are academic as well. And they're able to uh, answer these questions on that level. Can we use perfume which has alcohol in it? It's a difference of opinion amongst the ulama, but uh, Imam Hanifa considered it to be permissible as long as this, the alcohol is not made out of dates or grapes, which it never is for perfume. Um, is smoking haram? Yes. <laughs> There's some difference of opinion, but the old mashaykh that gave the fatwa that it's makruh, I feel very strongly that that they didn't have access to the data that more or less proves it's going to kill you. Uh, there, there's more di- difference of opinion about it. So if this is like a mufti sahab that says something else, you know, says, well, whatever guy said. No, I mean, it's not, it's not so haram that the person, you know, that it's not a difference of opinion. Maybe they have a very valid argument for it. But the nice thing about this fatwa that it is haram is that not only, you know, is it haram, but you also avoid the lung cancer. So just don't, if you're, if you're not addicted to it, very practically, don't, don't get into it. If you're struggling with it, Allah give all of us help. But if you're not addicted to it, it's just, it's not worth it. It's just, it's just a dumb thing to do. Um, you know, and the people who smoke, they'll tell you that, they'll tell you more than anybody else how dumb of a thing it is to do. Um, someone says, for happy life, you need four things, a good wife, a good neighbor, a good vehicle, and a big house. And that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that. I know of an author in which he said that that that, that, that I, I don't know if it's attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or, or uh, it's just narrated in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. I don't I don't recall because I'm not a muhaddith. Maybe Sheikh uh, Mufti Wasim can tell. But that that a good life is in having a pious wife and and having a uh, a good ride and having a house that's sufficient for you. Big doesn't mean like. You have to be in a mansion, but for your purpose, this is big enough that you don't feel constrained in it. Um, so, but, you know, 
those are the things maybe if a person has some dunya and wants to buy for, buy for themselves or their families out of the things that are permissible uh you know it may be more important than getting an iphone or whatever but uh but yeah and having a good, having good neighbors is important too there's a saying in arabic they say al jar qabl al dar look at the neighbors before you look at the house um that's that's good cuz you don't want nobody to have no crazy like you know like uh, islamophobic like protest up on you or nothing like that so but you know part of being good neighbor is that you should be good neighbor too right but go cook something and take it to your neighbors even if they hate islam they'll be like oh thanks you know it's hard to hate somebody who like brings you an apple pie or like chocolate chip cookies right uh, go ahead What to do when your mother is against you because you want to follow your deen? You have to honor your mother, but she hates you because you are becoming more pious and uh, and religious. It's kind of ironic because if she hates you becoming more religious and you're trying to obey her, then she hates you obeying her. But um, anyway, the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is la taat li makhluqin fi maasiyat al khaliqi, right? That um. There is no obedience to the creation and the disobedience of the uh, creator. So you can't obey uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't obey your parents and disobey Allah. So your your duty and your uh, your loyalty lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. I remember reading some fatawa, I, I would say back in the day, but Sheikh Hamza is going to laugh at me for saying that, but a couple of years ago, uh, where the scholars had written, I believe it was Mufti Rashid Ahmad Dihanwi who had written that, he said that even a mustahab act, even something that is preferable, not even sunnah for the wajib, that's a different level. But even a mustahab act, if your parents tell you not to do it, you don't have to listen to them on that fact. It's because your loyalty and your obedience lies within Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. And any parent that tells you, no, 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 you have to obey your parents, this is what deen tells you, no, deen tells you to obey Allah first, and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then if the commandments of the parents are not uh, against sharia, or dissuading you from sharia, then go ahead. As a more practical note, Okay. Oftentimes people be like, Oh, my mom hates me following the deen. And like, you know, do I have to listen to her? And then you go and talk to like auntie and she's like, No, I don't hate him following the deen. Like, I just want him to like do good in school and, and like, you know, get a good job or whatever. And he's like, No, I want to, I don't know, like go with my friends to the masjid. And he doesn't even do anything at the masjid. He just hangs out with his friends, right? People oftentimes, you know, the story changes a little bit when you get into the details, right? If your mother tells you to worship idols, don't listen to her. <laughs> okay? But sometimes she has advice and it's actually good for your deen. If you think it's like, if you think it's uh, uh, hard to pray five times a day, try praying five times a day when you have to t- work like two jobs and drive a cab or drive a cab for 20 hours a week or 20 hours a week, uh, 40 hours a week and 80 hours a week and, uh, you know, t- 10 hours a day and 12 hours a day and, uh, uh, you know, just to make ends meet because you didn't go to school and you didn't get yourself a good job. That's not part of the dunya. That's part of your deen. You're supporting your family when you, you know, it's considered sadaqah when you feed your wife and you feed your kids. It's part of the deen, right? And so oftentimes we think our parents are like, they're so lame. They don't understand what we're going through. and what They've been through it, right? Maybe someone's mother really hates Islam, but I don't think it's, it's really, it's probably not the case. So instead of jumping to like extreme conclusions first, just try to try to like see and like reason out, like ask your Mulana Saab or whatever person, people you have Qari, you have so many Qurra and so many ulama, mashallah over here. Give Mulana Mikhail Darulum, you have mashallah Mufti Saab is in Jersey. And go ask and like try to talk through it in a little bit more detail. Oftentimes it's not that black and white, you know. Um, please give encouraging advice for brothers and sisters to pray on time. Um, the nice thing about praying, you know, the thing about praying is that when it's time to pray, you just pray. Isn't that nice? Like, who here has prayed in public before, like in a park or something like that? Raise your hand. Right? Right? The first time I prayed, I prayed, I remember in school, in front of other people, and I was like, oh my God, they're going to kill me. What's going to happen? <laughs> they're watching me. They're looking. Trust me, dude. They, they don't even care. They think you're weird anyway. <laughs> Seriously, they, they're like, I don't know, Muslims, man. They're doing some mus- Muslim thing, dude. I don't know. It's their, like, what are Muslim little carpet thing they do? <laughs> Whatever. They all, they all assume you're doing stuff like that. They, they, you know, like, imagine I used to have a friend in college. His name was Rob, right? 
So Rob, Rob, like we invited him to the wedding of one of my friends, mashallah. Rob is a good guy, mashallah. Allah ta'ala give him hidayat, inshallah. He, 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 uh, uh, one of our, my friend Rizwan, he got married in the masjid and so he, so we were joking around. So Rizwan is like, hey, you, should we invite Rob to the masjid to, for the nikah? I'm like, yeah, Rob, inshallah, we'll invite you. We don't usually invite outsiders. You can come, but like, you know, make sure that you don't wear nice clothes because the goat sacrifice gets very bloody. <laughs> He's like, yo, dude, really? I'm like, no, you idiot, man. It's just, <laughs> I'm just joking with you. <laughs> That's what they think is happening anyway. It's like, so when they see you, like, you're just praying, they're like, oh, man, these guys must be like the, the moderate ones. Like, you know, they don't care. The other guy is already walking down the street with his purple hair and spikes and things. Like, they don't even care about that guy. You think that you reading namaz is going to like, they, they already assume you're doing it anyway. You know what I mean? They just don't care. You'll do it once, twice, and then you'll be like, whoa. How come nobody's like saying anything? Like how come nobody notices? Because they don't care. They have their life, you have your life. Be cool, don't trip, you know, don't be a loser, remember? Just the thing is when it's time for prayer, just pray. You know, if you if you're that like uh, picky about it, you can get them like little John Namazes, them little prayer rugs that fold up and you stick them in your pocket. This like cost like five reals in Hajj or whatever. They're really cheap. Stick it in the trunk of your car, stick it in your pocket or in your backpack. It doesn't weigh but anything and pray on it. I don't even do that anymore. I just pray like on the, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu used to pray in the desert like without a carpet. The message of the Prophet Sallallahu had no carpet, right? Right, I'll pray on the grass, I'll pray on the... It doesn't bother me, but maybe I'm a little different. If you like, really need to, you stick the prayer rug in your thing. How, how do you find the Qibla, you know? The sun rises in the east, it sets in the west. At high noon, it faces slightly south. It's not difficult to figure out. If you're in such a situation where you can't figure it out, just take your best guess and pray. And even that will be sufficient for you, inshallah. The thing about Salat is when it's time to pray, you just pray. If you're between classes, just go pray right there in the hallway, you know? Uh, it's America. It's the first the first amendment of the Constitution. Nobody can stop you from praying. Uh, nobody can stop your classroom. Nothing. You just tell them. Say, listen. Don't be like, oh, can I pray? No. Say, it's like, this is a prayer time. I gotta pray. No, you can't say no. It's the first amendment of the Constitution. Don't just spring it on them right in the moment. Ask beforehand before your exam, a month before your exam, when they tell you it's coming up and things like that. But you know, you make your arrangements. Same thing with Jama and stuff. The thing was, when it's time to pray, you pray. It's good to read all the sunnahs, it's good to read all the du'as and things like that, but in a jam, in a tight spot, in a pinch, right? Just read your fard. It doesn't take that long. Four rakahs, you can belt it out in less than three minutes. Right? If you learn fiqh, right, there's certain parts of the salat that are necessary for the salat to be valid, and there's certain parts of the salat, you know, like if you say subhanallah instead of subhanallah, you don't have to read all that. You can do that on your own time. Don't, for God's sakes, don't ever go to your job and tell your boss, I have to pray. And like, you know, and it's my right and blah, and you're praying for half an hour and like on the, on the clock payroll. That's khiana. You're getting paid to work. You pray your four rakahs as simply as you can and you get back to work. You want to do, uh, nawafil, you want to do your zikr, do it, do it on your own time. You know, your money is haram if you're, if you're doing that. You're, you're getting paid. Just do it very quickly, right? Uh, on a plane. I remember I was I was on a plane one. I, I, alhamdulillah, by Allah's fadl, I've always prayed standing on a plane. I've never I've never had to pray in, pray in my seat. All my prayers I prayed on a plane on time. The only person who ever refused me was a Muslim Airlines, two Muslim Airlines, and with them I was like, okay, I've been to your country before. Nobody obeys the law there. I don't really care what you have to say either. I just, I just read my my namaz right. But in American Airlines, don't do that. If you're in in America, don't do that because they have air marshals. They're armed uh, on the flight. And if you don't listen to the stewardess, she starts raising a fuss. The guy will pull, gun, pull a gun on you and cuff you. And that's in that point place. Uh, I'm not a mufti like Mufti Wasim Saab, but I'll give you fatwa that it's permissible to wait till you land if they tell you no. But I've never asked, and you have to ask in a smart way too. When they're serving the drinks on the cart, you can't be, and they're trying to do their work. You can't ask at that time because they need. But when they're done serving and they're just sitting down and relaxed, if you ask them, they'll never say no, right? In fact, people say. People say, uh, 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 oh, oh, pray for me as well. Or thank you for praying for us. I feel so safe now. Or, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> did you, you know, like, you know, some stewardess, you pray for me. Really? You promise? I'm like, okay, like, I just read in the Why are you flirting with me? Like, <laughs> the point is, is this, is right? What? When it's time to pray, what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? Pray. pray. <laughs> right? Are you a mufti? Do you teach Sahih Bukhari and Darulun Deoband? No. Right? Have you even taught Nurani Qaida to anyone? <laughs> you know Alif Ba, right? 
Yeah, alhamdulillah. Okay, he knows that man. But he doesn't need to, right? If there was someone here who doesn't know Alif Ba, even they would know. When it's time to pray, just pray. And all the like hang-ups a person has, all the fears that a person has, all the anxieties a person has, they'll just go and like after you do it two or three times, you'll, what's nice is you'll forget the people and you'll remember Allah. How nice is that, mashallah? Right? You'll be cool. You won't be tripping anymore, mashallah. Allah ta'ala give all, all of us tawfiq, inshallah. Yeah. It's your turn, bro. I'm out. It's your turn. <laughs> what do you think about establishing the khilafah? <laughs> The last question. What do you think about establishing the khilafah? I think it's great, mashallah. It's wonderful. <laughs> I'm not going to do it because I don't want to live in Guantanamo, Cuba. Right? Look, look, look. All joking aside, right? There are... Establishing khilafah is fard. It's fard. It's fard. It's an obligation Allah has imposed on this ummah. But it's not fard ain. Fard ain means what? Fard on every individual, right? Like if I read 10 salats, it doesn't mean that you don't have to read five. You know, I read my five, you read five, your five. I can't read your five for you, you can't read your five for me. The things that are fard ain, the things that are individual obligations are of higher priority. You got to get those straight first. Afterward, there are certain things that are what they call fard kifaya. Like, for example, if someone dies in the community, someone has to read their janazah. Someone has to. It's a fard on the entire community. But if, like, some people get together and read the janazah, the people who aren't there, the obligation is lifted from their shoulders. Right? So that's a fard uh, kifaya on the level of the community. Certain things are, f- like, a national fard kifaya, which is what? Right? There needs to be a place where people can learn the ulum of deen. Right? So Darulum is there, Mulana Mikhail is there, Mulana Suhail Teli is there, Mulana Ayameen is there, you know, Barakat Bhai, they're working hard, Allah Ta'ala give them reward. You can learn all the way from Alif Ba Ta'atha, all the way through Bukhari Sharif, now mashallah over there. Right? It's a fard kifaya on the entire country. So someone cannot get a visa to go to South Africa or to England or to India or Pakistan or, or Saudi Arabia or Egypt or, you know, Syria. Allah Ta'ala give the help to the people of Syria, Turkey. You can't go there. There's a place inside the country that everyone can go to. You go learn over there. You know, maybe it's not like as nice as the Hilton or the Marriott, but you'll get, you know, you'll get through it, inshallah. It's there for you, right? That's a kifaya on the entire country that they're taking care of. Khilafa is a kifaya on the entire world. It's a kifaya on the Muslims of the entire world. So if you as an individual, Allah will ask the entire ummah, did you do it or did you not do it? And if the ummah says no, then he'll ask those people who are able to make it happen. Trust me, you and me are not able to make it happen. We're like people who we get like impressed with a million dollars. Oh, a million dollars, right? That's how small, we're small people. Allah, you know, Allah forgive us and help us. We're small people, right? The people who have it within their power to make these decisions, they're big. Allah Ta'ala make all of you, inshallah, one day so important, inshallah. Right? But you're not able to make your own currency. If you want a country, you have to make your own currency. You're not able to make your own army. If you and me tried to join the army, they'd probably kick us out for being flat-footed or like lazy-eyed or whatever, right? <laughs> Even the American army, they wouldn't take us. And they have very... Anyway, khair. I'm, I didn't say that, okay? Right? So, you, you, you know, like, there's things, and even if you were, you're just, you know what I mean? It takes not billions of dollars to make an army, it takes trillions of dollars to make an army. Not to fight with other people, just even countries like Denmark that don't have any enemies or whatever. Even they have to have an army if you want to be a country, right? You have to have an economy. You have to, economy means what? You need to have enough jobs that people can work and make a living, right? There's not enough people in this uh, masjid right now that could even uh, make a, a grocery store. No, it's not a joke. It's serious, right? Inshallah, you guys will work hard. You guys will make money. You'll establish wealth. You, you know, there's like this, uh, in Queens, there's that Aaron's kosher supermarket next to Masjid al-Salihin. Masjid Jews, they got together. They made their own real grocery store. When's the last time you went to a halal, like actual full-size grocery store? We don't even have the wherewithal to do that, right? The Khilafah is, a, is a, a, a dream that if you're not able to make it, don't bend yourself out of shape or try to do something crazy or extreme in order to make it. Allah will not ask you about it. He'll ask the people who have the ability to make it. Trust me, there's Muslims in this world that have that much money, power, intelligence, etc. to do those things. Allah will ask everybody what they could do. What can you and I do? We can make dua. We can say that the sharia, the sacred law Allah Ta'ala revealed on the heart of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is better than any other law. We can say, we can practice it in our life as much as we're able to. A lot of people yell and scream about sharia, sharia and khilafah. I know, I can guarantee you, they don't fast correctly, don't pray correctly. A lot of people, not all of them. There's many people. No, do you fix yourself? Make dua for that, right? 
if you ever have a chance to uh, help in a productive way, not in a stupid way, in a productive way, right? So, for example, uh, uh, you know, stupid way is what? Some dude on, some girl on the internet said, if you join ISIS, I'll marry you. I'm a nurse in Syria and I'm going to marry you. Trust me, no nurse in Syria wants to marry you, okay? <laughs> no, it's, you think it's a joke, it's real. All these cases that they have on CNN, so and so got arrested and taken to, uh, uh, you know, whatever, and they make a big plot. Those are not plots. Those are just dumb kids that are like stuck, you know, they're, 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 they're stuck in a fantasy world. They don't, you know, spend time with the ulama. They don't have, you know, they don't, they're not allowed to have a girlfriend. They're not allowed to have, their parents are not going to let them get married until they've finished their master degree. And all of a sudden this beautiful woman on Facebook is like, oh, come do this. And it's for the deen, so it's good. And I'll marry you if you do it. And it's not even haram, you know. It's like, oh man, this sounds really good. Trust me, trust me, no Syrian nurse wants to marry you, okay? Right? That's a dream of something that you're not even prepared for. And they're not doing anything good anyway. Right? How do you make a Khilafah? You're not going to make Khilafah by running to Syria and like joining like some sort of crazy rebel force that is like killing more Muslims than it's, you know, doing any good in the world. How are you going to make a Khilafah? Khilafah needs to have a, Khilafah needs to have a, a place to do business. Right? Make a, make a, you know, make a Muslim owned strip mall that's financed completely through riba free financing. That's how you build a country. Right? Make a, a, a Islamic school somewhere where they actually teach the secular sciences and they teach the knowledge of the deen properly. Right? Many Islamic schools is either one or the other. Right? Do that. It's so difficult to do it. Do it. Make a good school that every year the kids that graduate from that school get in, into Harvard, get into Yale, get into Princeton, and they also know their dean down packed, their father of the Quran, there's, you know, things like that. You want to be, you want to be a, 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 you know, you want to ha- make a khilafah, you know, have, have an airline that serves halal food and doesn't serve alcohol, right? There's like only a couple of airlines that do it in the world and none of them are financially solvent. All of them, they all, none of them make money. Make one that makes money. Trust me, if you can make these systems work, kuffar will come and immigrate to your country. That's what used to happen, the Ottoman Empire. That's what happened, the Khilafah Rashida. That's what happened with the Banu Umayyah, Banu Abbas. That's what happened with the Mamluks. That's what happened, Salahuddin Ayyubi. His, you know, you, you, there's New York, there's a lot of Jews around here. Ask Jews who's the mo- their most important rabbi. They'll say, Rabbi Musa bin Maymun, Moshe bin Maymun, they call him Maimonides, right? They say that there was two Musas that came to our, uh, 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 to, to, to the Jews. One was the one who received the Torah, and the other is the Rabbi Moshe bin Maymun. You know where he lived? He lived with the Muslims. He was Salahuddin Ayyubi's personal uh, physician. Right? He was Salahuddin's personal physician. Why? Because Salahuddin had a nice, he had a country that was like put together straight. It was a place they'll want to come also. They won't arrest you. They'll say, no, let's join it also. It has to work though. It has to make some sort of sense. All the systems of state have to be in place in order for it to make sense. It's not going to happen by like a kid like running off and like killing people. If killing people is all we needed to make a khilafah, trust me, Europeans would have made a khilafah centuries ago because they're very good at it. It's more than that, inshallah. So what is it? Yes, it's a, it's a very lofty goal. We make dua, Allah can make it happen, right? And we work toward it in practical ways. In practical ways, not by, you know, I need to lose weight. There's one way that you cut back on your food consumption and increase your exercise. You lose 100 pounds after two years, right? And then there's another one, I have to lose weight, so I'm going to cut my leg off. <laughs> right? So make a practical goal out of it until we make, then we make dua. Anyone who denies the khilafah as part of the deen, that person has betrayed the Prophet ﷺ. It's, it's part of this deen, but again, practical measures. Allah won't ask anybody uh, to do, you know, why didn't you do something that you weren't able to do?